Hey everybody, I'm Sean Robinson. I'm Carson Gruba. And we Sean, are learning... where are you at? <laughs> I am in a secluded location. I may not disclose the state. Uh, this is not San Diego. I don't know if yeah. you can tell. I got some fancy space age Jetsons wear here. You're Keep somewhere warm. Yeah, you're somewhere cold. Sean's Sean's looping in from a secret location. Um high in the Andes mountain. And you've gone to this secret location to, do to secret find things. a very special book. Is that <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. This is all this is all a book hunt. You're doing um, research for, for to make sure that you know what it feels like to be the character in this book, right? Exactly right. It may or may <laughs> not be an unauthorized Tintin goes to Tibet sequel. Oh, okay. I don't uh, get to draw that one. Sean's going to draw that one. He's a better cartoonist than me. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so I'm a, from a secret location, but uh, we figured that we would uh, try to get uh, a, a video in here. And luckily, we've got something really fantastic to talk about. But before we hit that, uh, so Carson, we announced the next Living the Line book is going to be Plaza by the great Yuichi Yokoyama. Uh, and uh, it is, as far as I know, it's going to be out in September. Oh, and, we got a date. Okay, that's cool. Mm -hmm. Exciting. And you're going to be able to buy this thing in comic stores. You're going to be able to buy it in bookstores. It is a very wild book. If you've ever read uh, any uh, Yuichi Yokoyama uh, books, it is a uh, it, the Yokoyamaist, I would say. Uh, he really uh, goes uh, even further down into his uh, interests as a cartoonist, a really inventive cartoonist uh, who uh, uh, made a splash with his first English translated book, Travel, in 2014, which I believe was nominated for an Eisner Award. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, Travel, or sorry, Plaza is going to be coming out uh, in late September, and uh, that's the next book that we're going to be hitting. Uh, so I'm super excited about that. And uh, as a part of that book, it's going to be translated by uh, the great translator and um, manga scholar Ryan Holmberg. And so uh, Carson and I were sort of talking about other Ryan Holmberg translated uh, books, and uh, I hit one that neither of us had any previous knowledge about, um, and uh, that's what we're going to be talking about today. So uh, today, my goodness, uh, this is Troublemakers by Baron Yoshimoto, and uh, had you ever heard of Baron Yoshimoto before? No idea, and I, don't, I forget if you had me order the book or if you just sent it to me. I think yeah, I don't recall if I just sent it to you, yeah. <laughs> And I was like, what is this? Sean must have gave me this, but it looks cool. Uh, no, never heard of Baron Yoshimoto, and I'm, I'm glad that has been rectified. Yeah, uh, very, very interesting cartoonist um, and a very pivotal figure in uh, bringing uh, Gekiga to, uh, to sort of a more mainstream audience. And so uh, Baron Yoshimoto, uh, a lot of the work that was collected in, in this volume is from the it ranges from the mid uh, 60s to the mid 70s and um, he's a sort of pivotal cartoonist in um, taking sort of hard-boiled um, more literate uh, darker sort of male dominated comics and um, bringing those into a sort of more mainstream appeal and he drew for larger uh, magazines you know you can sort of imagine him as being a sort of peer, a later peer and rival of, you know, if you think about like Golgo 13 or something like that, where it's mm -hmm. like, it's got some of the trappings of the, um, some of the sixties Gekiga stuff, but, um, but a, a little bit more of a sort of, um, I mean, I, I, mainstream is the word that I'm looking for. Yeah, um, these seem le these stories are short and seem less mainstream. But the essay suggested that he had long ongoing series as well that we'll need to check out. Right, and so Troublemakers is um, is like you said, uh, you know, mostly short stories and is really sort of I think intended to be a uh, introduction to the artist who was actually still alive and oh. uh, thankful for us uh, still owns all of his original artwork. Because as we're going to see from the reproduction of the book, uh, <laughs> my gosh, you almost never see uh, stuff from this period looking so fantastic. And what a cartoonist this guy is! Yeah, I was really, I was really, really impressed with the reproduction. I was like, "Damn, this <laughs> this looks like they just scanned <laughs> it yesterday." 
Um, looks looks like Sean might have done this. Uh, and and yeah, really impressed uh, with how contemporary again the stories feel. It, this is maybe the third or fourth one that you've sent my way, where I've thought. Like at first when we we read the Suge stuff, I thought, "Ah, this is crazy. It feels like so contemporary." And now I'm just realizing, like, well, we just suck. Like the Japanese, <laughs> the Japanese have been doing really great literate comics, whether in short or long form, for since the '60s, right. and we're only now catching up to this level of like quality and writing. I think the the art is has always been competitive in certain realms, certainly, uh, yeah. but in terms of the writing, this is yeah they're just light years ahead of us. So yeah, and let, maybe let's let's start our start our flip through. But yeah, you'll 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 see uh, when we're talking about some of the stories. Uh, you know, he is a um, a very ex super expressive cartoonist, and he's also got um, a very well integrated social concerns. Uh, into the stories that are presented. Uh, so, you know, it, it's not like hit you over hammer with a social issue. Um, uh, it's it's more like he's got a very humane sort of approach to the characters and uh, even the sort of more humorous stories. And so this first one, uh, I, I'm very curious to see what you flagged that for that panel there, that's cool. Oh, I just said that's lovely. Yeah. That's the that's the one where I went. Okay, this is well reproduced because there's so much. I mean, they're not going to be able to see it on camera, I don't think, but yeah. so much variety of texture and mark making, and it's all just like so crispy in its reproduction, um, and then immediately like these drawings of the birds and all this little stippling. The the only other one I've seen so far that's this well reproduced is the Mizuki Tono Monogatari one that we looked right. at, yeah. um, and I think this maybe even tops that in terms of just crispness of reproduction and right because they got access to the art <laughs> right and that's uh, the difference what a difference it makes and you can see that uh he has a really wide variety of um you know different types of mark making and things like that and uh you know some of the stories maybe he works with the uh, assistants or studios and uh, maybe some of them are a little bit more solo but some of his across the stories there's sort of a general visual approach that you can start i feel like i can start to identify his line um or certain aspects of his line uh, and this first and, story and that's that's super important that's why i tagged this because i this is i mean what we're like four or five pages in and i, I wrote japanese strange death of you know a japanese alex raymond like i just linked it to all the art that i studied during that time like i swear to god i've seen that panel he like traced it from some american source this this looks familiar i mean it's a kiss mm -hmm. scene whatever but the line work in this you're talking about he has a distinct line it looks to me like he's a fan of stan drake or somebody in that lineage these right. aren't the type of marks i'm used to seeing and again maybe it's just because i'm too unfamiliar but it looks like stan drake inking this looks like um that era of art so that's where i think okay he does have this really distinctive um, like uh, American line to me, right? And and uh, uh, Ryan Holmberg text tackles that in the essay. Uh, he, he uses a very interesting adjective, which is apparently uh, a common phrase in Japanese. But he d describes his art as buttery. Uh, yeah, I don't get that. I don't well, know what he's talking about. But cause, well, because Amer Americans uh, use butter, uh, and uh, okay. Japanese food doesn't. Uh, uh, I mean, so, the art's not like smooth and slick. right. It's, it's no, actually no, a little no. rougher, but no, no, not at all. So the word buttery is just saying that it's American. Okay, uh, it's like Japanese influenced by American. You know, it, um, it is like this. This like little line with a like chuck, 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 but it's mm -hmm. all making one continuous line. Same on the jaw, like piling up like four or five lines to make one line. That was one of the most in indicative things of the style that i had to learn in strange death and i found it very interesting because most artists are going to go across a form and they would go down the edge right. of a form and yeah. he seems to have picked that up and run with it 
And, and if you look at some of the stuff that he did, um, uh, and uh, Holmberg shows a pay, sample page from something called MC Illustrory, um, and it's something Baron Yoshimoto did with uh, Hosumi Kazuo uh, in 1966, uh, early in his career, um, called Secret of Atlantis. And you see, it's of page 238, you see um, uh, a super influenced, like basically like, you know, attempting to be pastiche or close to pastiche like that's how influenced it is um including the yeah. upturned face who is that right there that's so we got like a sort of alex Raymondy panel but that upturned face i feel like that's a yeah i feel like some of this stuff is just straight up swipes yeah this is such a yeah the, the everything on this page is such a you know comic strip photo realist stylings like an alex raymond angle on the face this body here is handled that way um so i noticed that immediately in the book but you know of course i'm going to notice that i spent like five years of my life with my <laughs> nose and that stuff uh and 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 thematically too just the older man kissing the younger woman you know that was like the heart of julia jones starts out with that um it's yeah. it's much more insidious here and that's what i like about his work um is that he's he's dealing with some pretty dark shit uh like right here she comes in and immediately says oh daddy you make me so happy and i don't know like what the what the colloquial term that got translated there was it'd be interesting to talk to to ryan about that yeah um but yeah it's like this this daddy daughter sub story uh yeah this story is called erico's happiness and uh, she she's a, a schoolgirl who has got essentially like a sugar daddy. Um, and uh, as she's getting older, getting close to graduation day, the relationship is starting to sour. Um, and, uh, you know, there's all these sort of you get the Gekiga influence. You can see a little bit of that sort of like underground influence in terms of the like use of metaphor and stuff. You know, she's got these birds that she's feeding out on the patio. And the patio is like the only wild place that she can, you know, that's in the apartment. Um, yeah. And, and, uh, and just the, like, this panel here, I wanted to mention, like, I love this technique he does where she's all, like, it, it has that intensity of the Gekiga, the adultness of it. I mean, right. obviously the content, but the horrific nature of her being all white and then him blacked out with this really flat cross hatching nice. like he he this panel here shows he can cross hatch to round a form out but in this one he flattens the guy out right. and it it like really makes him so gross and removed and he does it here too but in other places he'll he'll round the form out and i just thought man that's a really sophisticated way to make something just icky <laughs> yeah. really icky uh and i mean the drawing is just unbelievable uh really really i the thing i the thing I, i'm really you know dig on is just his his calligraphic uh line which is not like in full you don't you know he doesn't totally go for it in this particular story but uh, you'll see it a little bit in some of the other ones uh he's just got total tool mastery of different tools and the birds and, you see it in the birds are, are right. really beautiful um this page to me was the it was this was like the culmination of or the summary of the story i think yeah. uh and it shows some of the intensity of the writing he says i found it or she says i found it funny how the smart adult sparrows gave food to the awkward baby sparrows one by one the greedy babies hopped around the adults begging for food beating their wings they didn't always depend on their parents they made efforts to take care of themselves yeah. Um, and it's like reinforcing this really gross kind of justification for pederasty, you know. Well, and and then uh, the 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 next page, you you get the relationship. You know, if I place their food in concentric circles, they eagerly worked their way from in from the outside. I mean, uh, yeah, like the luring. It's just uh, and 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 the total control of their environment from the you know the 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 adult, you know, I, yeah. I don't know. It's, it's wild. And, you know, he just lets that sit there, you know? Um, 
uh, which is not to say that this isn't going to beat you over the head with something because, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, the, 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 the story is not always like 100% in service of the message, which is exactly what you want. You know, you don't want the, you don't want it to be a seminar. Yeah. Uh, something. Yeah, exactly. And, and it's really unclear. Like sometimes it feels like he's celebrating these things rather than damning them. Mm -hmm. almost you know like it, it feels just like more oh, this is part of society you know let's take a look at it right. um it's also amplified by the fact that uh, i don't know where but it shows that this guy has women coming and going right um, you know so he has like three of them that he has lined up that come and go and they're well aware of each other too so there is this predatory stuff going on yeah she's she's just like her his three o'clock or whatever right yeah yeah but they she still feels love you know and feels special and i, I don't know right. it's pretty it's pretty gross uh, that, i love i love this here where all of a sudden he <laughs> i don't know if that's him or if he had a buddy come in and just throw a character in <laughs> i don't know he gets so loose in some of the other stories i think that's him yeah, um, and so. that guy's that guy's in the top left panel too in the background yeah I mean that that's just crazy you've got those two figures that are you know anatomically 100 percent accurate and oh god this monster in the background yeah. i love it i love it it's great stuff um the pants so, lines on that girl that's dancing by the way that was another like drake um the 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 little the crotch fold there um i don't know what it is about that particular thick yeah well, yeah, Drake will go thick in really strange places. Right. Um, and I noticed that a lot in here. Like, I, I really want to know, like, well, if he's alive, somebody find him and ask him, like, did he <laughs> like Stan Drake? Because I just saw Stan Drake all over this. Or Neil Adams, you know, maybe right. maybe he was yep. seeing Neil Adams who grew out of Stan Drake. But So this yeah. story is 72. Um... Yeah, so, I mean, those artists would have been well well yeah. established and almost on the backside of their careers for right. Stan Drake. Um, but anyways, well, I don't want to spoil the ending of any yeah. of the stories, but it, it takes a, <laughs> it takes an even more gross turn. Uh, I think they put this one up front for a reason. Like to me, all the stories were good, but this one just really, this is the one that stuck with me afterwards. Interesting. Um, yeah. It it's a lot of ground. Yeah, but this one really stuck with me. I don't know. Maybe it's just because, like, I've always, like, I've had gray hair for a long time. So I've been, like, the target of people looking for a daddy figure before. <laughs> uh, you know, like, when you're young but you have gray hair, you kind of draw some of that. So right. maybe, like, the ickiness of it all was, like, extra, uh, you know like I felt it more than some of the other ones. Uh, right. But there, there's an interesting consistency throughout the book too, I think, uh, in all of the different stories of, well, I we'll talk about it as we go. Yeah. So this is the next one, High School Brawlers Diddy. Yeah, and this one is a, apparently a parody of um, some types of existing uh, story forms that were popular at the time. Um, this one probably did a little less for me probably because I don't know the source material or the things that are being, um, this one was a little bit more like just appreciating the art, uh, the Marlon Brando figure here. He's got the, uh, yeah. Marlon Brando's hat. He borrowed his hat and his hair. Well, and the, uh, I like this cause they're the, like, I never thought about this, but they're filling their hats with cement and <laughs> then they're going to get, it's basically a gang fight story, right? right? Like there's a, a gang and they're arguing over a girl. And they go get in a gang fight and they're smacking each other with these uh, cement hardened hats. I thought, God damn, that's, that's, that's some pretty badass shit. Uh, and then there's like a Yakuza involvement, right, with some mm -hmm. of the bosses. Um, and on this one, I it's not totally the giveaway of the ending, but I love the final fight scene where they're going out and getting in the fight over this girl still. And the, the Yakuza boss has her... <laughs> and he's having his way with their uh like just this kind of hierarchy in these systems i thought was an interesting thing to expose and again right. a really uh really stan drake alex raymond type of type of illustration of a female i feel right. like 
Uh, it, it, there's the, another example of that uh, flattened uh, by uh, horizontal cross hatching across the boss form there, but he's carved it out on the face to give it the highlights, uh, which is a nice effect. Yeah, it's not quite as unsettling as that other right. one where he's got like a four-way hatching over it. Right. But it is this really, like, I don't know. It's weird because the male almost becomes the object in it. He's just like a thing that's there, mm -hmm. which should focus it on the female as the subject. But it doesn't. It flips it like she's just this toy that pretty much any old chunk of stuff could get on top of. and. I don't know. There's the, the the visual representation of that is so gross to me, but I mean that's that's what it needs to be. So right, yeah, for the story, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is this is the only one in the whole book that I felt like I was missing context for it. And uh, like I said, the essay kind of supplies a little bit of that, but uh, you don't know something viscerally if you don't read it. You know, there's just a lot of like I guess there was a lot of comics about these types of street gangs and stuff at the time. Mm. I don't feel like I needed that because it was, you know, the the ending of it drove it. Like, it, it didn't, it, it didn't, a lot of these stories, I think that was the other thing I liked about that first one is it got, it got me uncomfortable from the, from a couple pages in. Right. Um, a lot of them are kind of just, yeah, 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 things are going on. It's a gang fight. It's cool. It's, it's well written. And then the last few pages really drive home the ick factor. So right. this one resolved for me in those last couple pages. So, this was this was your favorite one, right? Yeah, I think insect is probably well. F favorite is an interesting word. Yeah, this is the one that had the most. Uh, I had the most intense reaction to. Um, yeah, that's so, a, that's a better way to put it. Yeah, <laughs> you can you can see these first few pages here uh, are hand painted, and um, he he did them in preparation for duotone. I don't know what the actual printed duotone pages would have looked like, but you get to see the hand painted uh, versions of it here. And man, is it beautiful! Thank goodness uh, he kept his art. <laughs> what, what was that? I said, thank goodness he kept his art. Oh, I know. Yeah. It kept the original art. So we got it. I direct. love this right here. Yeah. This is just really something else. So he's following these boys around and these boys are just destroying everything that they go by. And he goes to try to pick up the flower and rep repair it. And as soon as he takes his hand away, it falls back down again. And the same thing, these boys have cut up a moth he tries to put the wing back on. So this is our main character for this story. Um, and, you know, he's a kind of a simpleton, or at least that's the way that the other people around him think about him. And um, you get an idea that he's living in a really shitty situation. His, uh, he and his mom live in like essentially a shack at the outside of town. And, um, you know, he barely have what they need. And these other guys, this one guy is, is just like the, you know, son of the head of the town. And it's just, you know, they walk all over him. Here's some more real Stan Drake mark making too on the, the way he draws the clothes. This one really had it. it the later he goes, the more I saw that stuff. Because the dates kind of jump around in this book. Right. Yeah, this one is 70 um, <clears throat> and 73. <clears throat> um, and yeah, you can see uh, just the range of ways that he depicts things uh, is quite quite wide. Yeah, like I love these drawings here, and then this little bit of text too. Survival of the fittest. No earthly creature can escape the essential law of evolution. Those that succeed in competition pass on their superior genes to the offspring. Those that do not are extinguished. Such are the laws of natural selection. Yeah, and that's kind of playing out, right, with the, the simpleton right. being of lower genetics. That's the, uh, yeah, that's the, that's his supposition, yeah. Yeah, and they they grow up, like you're seeing these two characters go through life getting older. Yeah, and he's working at a factory, um, and, uh, you know, the guy comes in as a boss at the factory and later owns his own competing business, and... Um, you know, you see that the that the that the, the main character is a very like caring, loving person, but that doesn't do him any good because he is slower than other people and needs different things than the other people. And um, there's a just like devastating buildup to his like rage 
Yeah. And it's quite, quite extreme. And, and I love how he shifts to pencil here. Yeah. Like that was a really, the only other time I've seen that is Blade of the Immortal. I don't know how frequent that is, but that he does, he does switch rendering styles and then he'll even switch tools all with one, within one story. Um, and I found that interesting. You know, that, that one panel was just like, I, I don't know. It's just, yeah. again, so sophisticated to me. And so for, it feels forward thinking still, but I think that's just because we're so damn far behind. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's great. And I, I think this one maybe is like the key to the the book as a total, yeah. like when, when Ryan Holmberg was like, curating these i feel like this was the key to the curation that this is a story of like outsiders getting their comeuppance or getting stepped on or snapping you know that seems to be kind of a theme throughout the thing um and, and it's definitely a story that people who have read um you know yoshihiro tatsumi uh the stuff of his that's available in english and people who have read the suge books that are available in english will probably recognize this. Um, and, and, you know, Suge's brother as well, uh, Tayo Suge, um, they'll recognize the tone of this story, I think. Um, A lot of these ones, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I suppose, I, I suppose yeah, across the whole thing. Um, the, other, the other formal thing I thought was really fascinating about this one, and we're gonna come to it back to it in a few other stories too, is some of the breakout panels where he uses super thick uh, rendering. Do you have an example on a page? Uh, well, like on 86, that same page that has um, um, that same, the, the, the cityscape there with the clouds, the hatching in the clouds. That's the same page that has that simple line art. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. I hadn't noticed. The whole panel there, it looks like a different artist almost compared to like this one here. Right. Yeah. It, it, exactly. I mean, and, and I'm confident it's not. Uh, he uses that same technique in a few other uh, uh, the stories that we're going to see. But yeah, um, look at the, the bottom of 82 uh, as well. Um, the bottom middle panel on 82, the, all of that is just rendered much thicker than you might imagine. That's another sort of move that like I associate with Raymond. Um, this as yeah. well, yeah. Uh, we're all of a sudden like just having a sort of counterintuitive use of line weight. Um, it gives like a bluntness to it. Yeah. Like it makes it uh, heavier. He does it. Yeah, it is him because he does it here too. Like it has a, a bluntness to it, like these panels here. Right. And then, yeah, you'll have like also like a thick, thick weave here and a thin weave here. So he's doing some graphic design stuff with it. Like this thin hatching here versus the thick weave there. Right. Yeah. It's a, and he really does have a variety of approaches. Uh, we'll we'll see that in the next story, <laughs> which is what's the, uh, come on. That's that's Alex Raymond all the way. Oh, that's interesting because you know what I was thinking is I would. Uh, do you think Paul Pope? Uh, I mean, had looked at this. Well, I mean, I think it's virtually impossible. But yeah, I mean, it just that that looked like a Paul Pope face with like a slightly more controlled line yeah alex raymond yeah I, yeah i take see. the face off and it's it's really similar to some of those at least that general era of illustration stan drake alex raymond yeah just the the even the anatomy of the figure a lot of the the way that the wrinkles are rendered the hair um yeah it's just so familiar to me now it's it's yeah. kind of strange but yeah this story is then you have like wild cartooning wild absolutely wild and 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 you get an idea of uh what his some of his long form work might be because this story the gambling stripper is actually a chapter in a longer serial that he did i don't think it was a su super long serial um but i i get the feeling that he got to draw this guy for a while and so he got to you know find an approach that he really likes but basically every panel <laughs> that guy is the most cartoony person in the story right no, and, I mean, no, some of these strippers, <laughs> some of the strippers are like, to, like totally wild and really, really round and bouncy. To, to me, this is buttery. Like, this is buttery. <laughs> like, all these characters here are so weird and abstract. So this guy's kind of in the middle, like, compared to her. But the, the first stripper there is like almost like a Roberta Gregory bitchy bitch. 
uh, figure. Yeah, they're crazy. And each one's kind of different based on their body type. And then the main <laughs> one they're talking about, like, you know, it was like, yeah, look at these. She's got the hairy armpits. And this is like her <laughs> hair's blowing off. Um, it, it, and then you have this and it's like, how the hell is this? The... But they all sit together really comfortably on the page. He does. He, he's got some unification through, you know, mark making. Uh, but but man, are, does the, are they varied? Uh, and this one again is kind of an underdog story that rises up. Right. Um, this this <laughs> this part cracks me up where he comes in and he's like. And again, look at all the fun, bouncy cartooning. But he's trying he's trying to get like the best dance review, right? Like he's trying to build this thing and he's trying to get his strippers to be super classy. And it's, uh, what are you doing? You look like a kid. You can't just toss your clothes off. And then she's laughing and he says, ha ha, what? You too, don't you dare fart again in front of the customers. But they said they find it hot and they're all woo -hoo -hoo -ha. and he's like and you need to wash your front better your body is a temple you, everything should be trim and fresh when you open the gates <laughs> and like just that behind the scenes like this guy trying to control this unruly room of women that are like yeah whatever dude <laughs> but it, it even says earlier on he's like well the men don't really care <laughs> yeah but, but for him it matters you know <laughs> well, she's like, they like it. They think it's sexy when I fart. And even that feels like I, no one would have had, I don't know, I shouldn't say no one, but that feels like pretty contemporary to even talk about that, right? Like, oh, the strippers farting in front of the customers. Like, I don't know. That doesn't feel like something I would have read in an American comic in the, unless it was an underground comic. But uh, they wouldn't have been this literate either if they were mentioning that kind of stuff. So I really like that page. I thought that was great. It, it's um, it's wild how good his cartooning chops are um yeah. and uh, you get the feeling that like you know i i don't know I, I looking at some of these panels you get the feeling that he could have you know done like a rumiko takahashi kind of uh you know serialized comedy forever or jack kirby if he wanted mm -hmm. to <laughs> that's like what and this, like, this is a very American to have the movement this way. Like, right. I don't feel like I see a lot of that in the manga either. Like, it's always kind of like more like this in the background. And that hand and the rendering on the jacket and stuff, this feels like him doing Kirby to me. And the character flying with the, the motion <laughs> lines. That, that felt very much like him trying something different. That you know, throw. Yeah, great. And then again, these weird, chunky, like more realistic images that you're mm -hmm. talking about. Um, yeah, yeah, the combination of the of the realism and the chunkiness is the thing that really th throws me through me at first, and you know, definitely gave me like a man. How how do you pr come across that approach? Similar to like the Cam Kennedy color thing. It's like you know somebody's worked to find this. You know. Well, that's Milk Kniff, right? Like those right. big, chunky, but pretty realistic backgrounds from Milk yeah. Kniff, these photo reference background, but then you just, right. <laughs> um, you know, so if he was looking at those old strip artists, for sure. I really and, like this story, too. Yeah. And another one that's like, I mean, super understated social commentary. Yeah. And again, kind of a loser story. Mm -hmm. Um but I like that it's like it says it's based on a poem. Mm -hmm. And I like that I couldn't tell what there's certain things <laughs> that like the beginning for sure was probably the poem. But right. then there's other times that captions show up where it doesn't feel like the poem. But I was never quite sure. Yeah, and I, I kind of like that, that he was I mean, I, I'd have to read the original poem, but it feels like he really just was inspired by it and used bits of it and then flexed and bent around it. Right. Yeah. So this guy uh, finds a, a, a woman and a kid playing by uh, this industrial area and he remembers the girl's face, or at least he thinks back to a girl that he knew before. And uh, the guy uh, you gradually find out is Korean um, and works a sort of dead end job where he manufactures furniture, but does not design it. <laughs> this is very specifically said. Yeah. Um, but what he does do, like on and his he kind of sucks at it. Like, what's that? 
like they'll show him kind of sucking at it too. Like he's right. kind of a screw up at the job. Like they'll smack him. Um, yeah, he's not that great at what he does either. Right. Um, and, but what he does enjoy doing is painting these seascapes. You still there? Yeah. Did I freeze? Yeah, I can't. I can't really hear you. How about now? Uh, am I back? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, we'll just. But what he does. That out. Yeah. Uh, what he does enjoy doing is painting these seascapes, and that's where she finds him one day. And he goes out there and he um, <clears throat> paints from observation with a palette knife only. Uh, but she's like, they're not blue. <laughs> like, yeah, they're, they're not, like these you know, dense black paintings. And she keeps on trying to correct him, like, well, can you just make it a little bluer? You know, and she ends up coming and seeing him a bunch of times. Uh, but the answer is no, he can't come, he can't make it bluer because he wants everything. He wants all the paint uh, to be on there. And he just builds it up and builds it up and builds it up until it's way too dense. Yeah, he says, he, and he calls himself a crow. He's like, <laughs> uh, maybe because I'm like a crow. And she's like, a crow? Yes, a greedy crow. I want red and yellow and blue and purple. I want them all and can't make up my mind. So eventually it turns out black. Um, but I felt like this one is also thematically resonant with the first one, except like, you know, it's an older man and a younger woman, but he's totally not manipulative in here. It's a more tender yeah. kind of interaction that they have. Another Super Stan Drake uh, sleeve, mm -hmm. too. Uh, but I really like that moment. Like, it's that kind of writing that I think really sets this stuff apart. Like, I still don't even feel like many American comics that I read have dialogue like that. I'm a greedy crow. I want it all. So eventually it turns all black. Like, right. I don't know. There's just some wisdom in that that we still, yeah. we just still don't get. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's a, you know, it's a literary approach to uh, comics and and taking a lot of the and then, and the slap. Uh, the slap. Again, some like it's like Kirby mixed with Drake. Like the rendering is Drake, but the kind of weird dynamic, but stiff, clunky fist. Like, uh... yeah. yeah, this this guy has been basically abusing him and is in, basically has been watching him have the relationship with this girl you know i say relationship they're just talking about the seaside yeah. right but yeah. she gives an implication that she's gonna have to go away to germany and she gives an implication that like she hasn't kissed anybody and like maybe this would be something that they might do before she goes anyway this guy who's like his superior officer basically humiliates him and is like well did you tell him the truth uh, that you're not japanese you stink like garlic so i'm sure she figured it out um, and you get the idea, like the heavy prejudice that this guy is uh, facing and, and the standards that this guy is held to. And he is having to restrain himself over and over again when somebody else abuses him and finally smacks him. And, and then his, he, his real strength that he's been holding back the whole time. <laughs> right. And he finally smacks the guy back uh, and, you know, <clears throat> basically, you know, gets out of that particular situation, but makes things worse for himself. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's a really nuanced dealing with prejudice and the entire thing, it doesn't rub your face in it. It doesn't say like, go out and date Koreans, Japanese people. Like, it's just, it's not, it's not telling you how to respond to it. It's just showing you somebody and allowing you to draw the conclusions, you know? And, and you can even like, like I, I was, I wasn't even focused on the prejudice aspect of it, honestly. Like I was focused on their relationship built around the painting, his longing for her, um, you know, like the the poetry and, like I didn't take that away from it at all. So it's there, but like it's it's a richer, more complex story than that where you can pick up different things, right? Because right. it's it's called nostalgia. So I was focused more on that aspect of it. I mean, it does have this stuff too where the internationale unites the human race and whatnot um but yeah i mean that's again literature too is you can deal with multiple themes 
right. and, and not pound things home. I feel like a lot of stories now just pound on one hammer or yeah. one nail over and over and over again. It's like, yeah, yeah, I know your outlook, you know, like I get it. Um, here's another really weird, chunky, realistic <laughs> piece, by the way. And then, then like this blacked out faces too. Mm -hmm. It's very strange with just her. Um, and then this next page has another one of the seascapes that we've been treated to a few times. I just love the openness of the, the cartooning of the figures on the bottom on the, on the left-hand side page uh, against the dext, the dense textured, uh, you know, pen, pen and ink uh, seascape. And you, you see him getting lost in that because he's looking and he just sees all of the ocean paintings that this guy's, the guy has done. And then you, when you have the transition for the next page, he's painting there alone by himself, the same place where the girl used to show up all the time. Um, and just him slashing, you know, the air, the sea, the space in front of him. Ever and then, more violently did the man churn the sea with his palette knife. And, and then that transitions to back to the present with the ball up from the little boy falling into the water. And he rescues cleverly rescues the uh the ball for the little kid and they leave yeah <laughs> like, oh. it's really good it's i mean it's a really complex uh yeah i it's it's super impressive stuff um this one really this is the oldest story in the book i think yeah 1966 this so this is three. this is the one where the theme of prejudice is like this one's like way, way more in the forefront right um, yeah and and so a good four years earlier than anything else um in the book and also um probably drawn smaller i don't know that was my definitely drawn faster um, more more like less realistic he was focusing more on cartooning uh, speaking of your Yuichi Yokoyama Plaza book coming out, I felt right. like this one is like an early precedent for that with everything kind of getting hidden behind the abstractness of the lines and the lettering. Mm. Uh, there was a lot of, like, this kind of looks like like if Yokoyama pulled back <laughs> from the abstraction, right. a lot of these scenes. And and the, the bigger, thicker, more cartoony lines and stuff, I, I really felt like I don't know. I just, I, I also feel like he hadn't been exposed to the Stan Drake or Alex Raymond or whatever he saw. He, this looks more cartoony, like, you know. Yeah, well, it, it, to me, it, it indicates that he's able to turn these things on and off because this is the same year that he was doing that sort of pastiche uh, short story that is excerpted in the very back. Okay. Um, so I, I, I think that he just... You know, he's a, he's a super gifted stylist and, uh, you know, at least in the early, yeah, so that's 65, right? This is, this is July of 66. 66, the same year. Yeah, but maybe this is earlier in the year and then he, he <laughs> found this stuff and like really went and just started tracing and then brought the cartooning in it together. I don't know, yeah. this just feels to me like he just hadn't seen that. None of the none of the mark making is there that i recognize or anything i i'm not sure i i just wonder like if this was you know uh january of 66 and yeah and it's very possible it looks like it was published in november of 66 um but uh yeah it's possible i mean who knows what the but you know who knows what the conditions it was drawn under were too but it's 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 a really quite intense story i mean it's really something else yeah so this uh black soldier saves this woman uh but she doesn't want to be saved because she's she's prejudiced against black yeah. people and and i i like that he says well why do you hate black people so much and she said one of you raped and killed my mother so it wasn't like it wasn't yeah. just like as a category well it is as a category but it's not just because like there's like I remember I, when I taught uh, when I was a substitute for high schools, uh, I had kids fight in a class and there, some of them were Norteños and some of them were Sereños. And I asked them, I, I asked one of them, I was like, why do you hate the Sereños so much? You know, these two different ga uh, Hispanic gangs in California for people who aren't aware. 
And she said, well, uh, the girl told me, well, Serenios bitch punched my sister and made her have a miscarriage. Um, so it's not just like a generalized grew up in a racist society. Like it's when something personal happened and then you extend that to the category yeah. as a whole. Yeah. And that's like a more complex, again, it, like a less in your face. Right. More nuanced and, and, version of it. And, and you see her, her developing. So she's a French, uh, she's French. And uh, this is during World War II. And you see her developing attitudes because at first she's like alerting these German soldiers to there's an American here because she wants to get away from him. And he's yeah. like, what are you nuts? Yeah. And of course the Germans, they try to rape her, you know, like that's the, this is the, you know, he's trying to save her. And, and we sort of go through this evolution with her where you realize like this dude is, is doing everything he can for her and everything that he can is a hell of a lot. Uh, by the end of the story. Yeah, <laughs> this is where they take her. And she's like, I'm French. And it's like, come on. And then they try and rape her. And that that moment of like, oh, man, I judged. I judged an entire race based on the action of one member of it. And like any member of any race, any ethnicity, nationality is capable of this. Right. Uh, that's a, a hell of a moment. Oh, this right here reminds me of something else I want to talk about. I was not big on the lettering in this book. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't, Mostly. I don't like this lowercase thing. But there was, yeah. I think it was in the stripper story, or no, in the the poem story. The story with the poem, they switch into a different font. Yeah. There's some point where they switch into a different font. No, it's not it, that one. There's Anyways. some incident, incidental texts in various places that use different fonts, and it's such a relief from the main one, which is not a very good choice, I would say. Well, and there's one that really likes. He, here it is, the this font here, um, really looks like his his Japanese lettering in the song, and right? I, and that, so it's that's something that, that that was my only complaint about the book, and I'm just noticing it because here it's so they had to bump it down to like get it right. to fit in here. But I don't yeah. Uh, like yeah, I don't know. There were some issues with that that I had, but other than that, it's fantastic. Yeah, there's, there's been actually a discussion, uh, you know, not to wade into Twitter stuff because we know how Twitter is, but uh, there's been some discussion about the difference between translation and lettering and different things like that. And this is a, an interesting case where the lettering is well executed sometimes, uh, but what actually I think was really needed was a design decision at the beginning to incorporate a better body font for the main text, for the main body of text. Um, and, you know, Personally, I think that everything should be uppercase in comics um, in general. Agreed, but, yeah. But even if you do go with an upper lower mix, what you have to do as a designer is you have to select a font that doesn't have the descenders make up such a small percentage of the character. So so uh, the descender is like, if you draw an H, for instance, a lowercase H, you draw a line straight down and the descender is the, the hump. Um, and uh, when the height of the descender is different depending on the font that you choose. And the thing is, is when you're selecting a font for, for cartooning like this and you have to get maximum amount of readability and maximum amount of coverage for an area that you're filling in, uh, the, the descender height is basically determining how much different does a capital letter look from a lowercase letter. And the, the lower the descenders are, the more white space you're adding into your balloon. Yeah. Uh, which is a very inefficient and graphically displeasing uh, so you and can have thinking about like what resonates stylistically with the art like right. this right here <laughs> I probably get in trouble for that now uh yeah. that has the same quality as his line work this feels like a typewriter or a right. website you know here again it's like this and they're picking this font like they've used it elsewhere yeah. so i don't know it's it's just something that I've never liked this typewriter looking font and I've never liked upper and lower case. Um, yeah, but really, really rarely do I, I find that use, useful in comics. Anyways, I just I, yeah. remember that because I the, saw that. But back it, to the it, story. It, yeah, yeah. well, the, the, the interesting thing that I wanted to, to kind of add to that is just the idea that you could have the exact same lettering and it would be significantly better if the designer had made a different choice in the beginning. Um, okay. so, so, you know, sometimes you can, 
it you don't know unless you're involved in the production of a book what's involved and who made a certain decision and what other things that they're up against. And in fact, a lot of times licensors um, sometimes will you know say I want a particular kind of thing. And uh, this particular uh, font is very very similar to like the uh, I don't know I used to have a Golgo 13 book that was put out by um, uh, by his studio in English by themselves. They hired a translator by themselves and like mm -hmm. sort of put out like a early book and it looked almost identical to this. Um, and it's because they are used, you know, the Japanese companies are used to using mechanical lettering. But of course, the Japanese mechanical lettering looks very different and functions very different than English mechanical lettering does. Um, yeah, and so when you don't read the language naturally, you're probably less sensitive to right. what what is like easy on the eyes for a natural user right. of that language. That's interesting. I never thought about that. And if he was yeah. a if he was in the same vein as that, he might have said, Well, I really like that Gogo thirteen, like I want that right. used. Yeah. <laughs> or or pictographic um languages visually look different, you know, if you don't have ascenders and descenders uh yeah. in your language, then you've already got a visual different visual form to deal with in the first place. The pictogram takes up roughly the same amount of space per pictogram, you know? Like a in square, kind of different exactly. in squares. Yeah. It's it's interesting. That's an interesting discussion. Um yeah, we, we should do a video sometime about lettering. I think that that would be a, a, a useful thing, especially since you and I have picked up so much from uh, uh, from uh, Dave Sim, but, uh Yeah, I feel like I've picked up like 2.2% 2, 2 of what he has to offer, but he really opened my... I guess that's the other thing is by working with him, I got my eyes opened up to stuff like leading and things that I never even looked at before. Now it drives me crazy, right. like out of the box leading and stuff. Uh, anyways, I don't want to distract from yeah. the story, which is... This really intense moment where, yeah, she she realizes that she's kind of being uh, like she's at danger from anyone. And so you can't use that to make categorical judgments. Um, and then as he's dying, uh, he suggests, I think it's not explicit, but um, he's talking about his mother being a beautiful French woman. Right. And she realizes that his mother was white and like, that's why he's been saving her. She was so kind. She died when I was only 15. I never met my father. My mother never spoke about my father. My mother hated my father, but she was kind to me. And uh -huh. in there, I read that as a suggestion that he's the child of a rape. Right. Like that she hated the father, but never judged him. Yep for coming from that like you know even though she didn't want him and he's a product of a rape and that like really cycles in the whole story is like oh jesus it, it made me think of i don't know if you've ever seen the movie crash uh, uh it's it's like uh, a it's like a multi-character kind of cycling of of a bunch of character stories in la and there's a scene early in the movie where kevin dillon alex raymond's who is he? He's like Matt. a grandson or something like okay. that. Actor Kevin Dillon. Matt Dillon? Um, no, no, no. Kevin Dillon. Okay. Uh, he not not Matt Dillon. Kevin, I believe it's Kevin Dillon. He he's playing a cop and he pulls over a black couple, uh, a really well-to-do black couple, and he's being a racist piece of shit and pulls them over, and um, he fingers the wife, like as part of the pulling them over and making them get out of the car and stuff. And he likes, you know, sexually assaults the wife and the husband being a black man in L.A. with the white cop just lets it happen. And that causes tension in a relationship. And then later in the movie, she gets in a car wreck and that same character, the cop who molested her, is like the guy on the scene that crawls into the car that's about to explode on the freeway and saves her life. And she's sitting there like screaming, like, no, anyone but you, anyone but you. <laughs> and it's one of the most emotionally intense scenes I've ever seen in a movie where this completely despicable person also becomes heroic. And like, I don't, the, the, the woman having to reconcile all of that information, it, the, you know, this guy that assaulted her is the guy that saves her life. This had that kind of intensity to me. Yeah. Um, 
as it continued to build and build the theme and then this right there was just like oh jesus um yeah so uh a quite quite a intense uh, story and quite an intense book and um I don't know. Uh, I, I I wish that I had another uh, ten volumes of uh, uh, Baron Yoshimoto to uh, page through. But this is what we got for now, guys. Well, Mr. Yoshimoto, you're still alive. Uh, you've obviously worked with Ryan Holmberg, who's working with Sean. So <laughs> <laughs> Sean's a fan, uh, yeah. and and I am also a huge fan. Just absolutely impressed with the art absolutely stunned by the range of styles i feel a real kinship to a lot of a lot of type of mark making that i've come to fall in love with um and then yeah i just continue to be blown away by the sophistication of story in japanese comics uh you know light years ahead of where we're at and and i think i think we'll all be better off um you know, the more the more of that kind of stuff gets translated into English, the more it's going to set precedents for like what comics can be, and and you know we'll have to learn and up our game. So yeah, it'll be interesting to uh, talk about some of those uh, other classics that have uh, recently uh, come out. But it is it's an interesting thing when you talk about the comics canon and the majority of the stuff you can't see, <laughs> you know, if you, unless you're quadrilingual, you know, I mean, you have to, you have to read uh, uh, Japanese and English and French and Italian and, uh, you know, uh, Portuguese and Spanish, and I'm sure I'm missing other, you know, large <laughs> comics cultures here now, but yeah. um, you realize how, how uh, you know, there's this really interesting uh, large world out there and a world that was not untouched by stuff that we know too. Uh, as we were, uh, you know, finding out when we were looking at the influences of various stuff, uh, you know, it's very interesting to see somebody who, you know, has got this buttery, buttery yeah. style. Um, I so that's, uh, that's the biggest thing that I've learned since we started doing this. And since, since you like have committed to, you know, releasing a number of books, a lot of them being translation. And then I get all excited and I'm always, I'm I, I'm always sending Sean things. I'm like, look at this, look at this, look at this. And he's like, well, you know, like, like slow down, man. Like I just, you know, I've all published one book and like, we can't, we can't translate the whole world, but it's you, like, when you start seeing like how much stuff is out there, it's hard not to be like, like, I, you know, you wish you could do it all. Cause it's this insane amount of good stuff. Yeah. And, and this is a teaser, you know, this is 196 pages page book, much of which is part of an essay. And, uh, you know, this is like a little, uh, oh, sorry, it's 200, 230 page book. Uh, it's a little sample of uh, the thousands of pages that Baron Ishimoto uh, drew. Yeah, and, it's um, nuts. It, you know, it's, it, I'm very, very eager to see um, if there is uh, more out there that'll be able to be released in English. But in the meantime, please go pick this book up. This is from, uh, is it Retrofit that put this out? Yeah, Retrofit. Um, and uh, I didn't have any problems uh, getting my copy. They've got good distribution, uh, so you can pick it up in uh, the U.S. and Europe. Um, and uh, what else can they pick up, Carson? Uh, they can pick up The Strange Death of Alex Raymond. There's there's some back behind me there. Those are the Blue Meanie ones that by the time this video gets released, all of the time-lapse videos of me sketching in the Blue Meanies will be available, so you can check those out. And those are available on the Living the Line website uh you can also just get if you haven't already a regular copy of strange death of alex raymond and then sean you you i was prompting you for one book and you went and talked about another book but it's on your website and i've seen you announce it on instagram so uh what other book could they get uh that going to the snow would be good research <laughs> Yeah, we're looking at um, a uh, fantastic uh, book uh, called The Exile that's going to be coming out in um, probably October, uh, possibly as late as November, but I'm going to shoot for October. I'm going to shoot it for just a month after Plaza. And um, The Exile is by Eric Creek, who is a, a Dutch language artist, who is a great illustrator and uh, is a very um, 
he's a he is a works in a classic illustration style that is really reminiscent of uh you know turn of the century uh book illustration you know he uses like a limited palette uh really expressive expressive brushwork and really expressive figures and he's got a great story uh it is a viking story what eric uh, has referred to as uh my my viking western which I think uh, gets to the heart of it uh, pretty well, uh, where it's got a really con self-contained story with um, several different families. Um, and it's not like a sprawling type of thing. It's a very kind of contained story in the sense of everybody being in one location and everybody sort of interacting in this one space. And uh, I'm actually working on the um, <clears throat> on the finished text for it right now. Um, and uh, and uh, it's been, you know, hopefully, hopefully gonna letter it uh, when I'm back from this trip. Um, and uh, gonna get some assistance with the lettering from uh, from Graham, who's doing uh, social media uh, with us right now, and uh, super excited about that book. And we'll have another one to to announce right after that. But um, it's from a label called Scratch Books. And if you guys have never checked out Scratch Books, um, they are a publisher in the Netherlands. And man, they have a great catalog. They sent me that catalog, and I was just looking at it and just drooling over it. basically every single book in the catalog. Um, yeah, that was one of the ones where you sent me and you're like, hey, what do you what do you think about this? Like, what do you think about those? And I was like, well, all of them like, well, I can't do all of them. It's like, well, OK, I, I had just done the the at the suggestion of one of our subs. I you can check a video out of Eric Creek's Gutsman, which is awesome. Uh, he's not using color in that, but you can see his illustration abilities. Um, so I was really excited about him already. And uh, I had seen some of the artwork from that one Fanographics had done. So I was yeah. aware of his color style and then that had the, and I was like, you got to do the exile, but like get all the rest of them too. <laughs> so it's, it's exactly that problem of like, that's just one label in one smaller European, yeah. country. like Jesus. It's true. Crazy. And so, they're fantastic. They, and they're, they're incredibly uh, awesome people too, over at scratch books, really, really great. Uh, and, uh, and, I, I will tell you a secret, Carson. Here's a here's a secret for you, just for you, okay? Um, we're gonna do another scratch book too. Okay. Hopefully, that's like an ongoing. It becomes a relationship because we, we, we've got we're contracted for two for two scratch books. I'm not ready to announce the other one yet, but I'm super excited about it. Okay. Uh, yeah. Awesome. And if their catalog had all kinds of stuff, so yeah, yeah, uh, it's the it's a it's a treasure trove. And uh, you know, if you uh, if you read Dutch, uh, they're available now. <laughs> uh, but if you don't, uh, yeah, just wait a little bit. Yeah, Sean's working on some. <laughs> awesome. All right, well, well, it's great to talk to you guys. Enjoy, uh, or... <laughs> enjoy your vacation. Enjoy Thank the you. snow. Uh, we're getting hot here in Alabama now, so I'm a bit envious, but I'm sure you're envious of the, the humidity and heat. So. I've got to take my coat off. It's getting a little bit hot in here, yeah. too. Uh, or maybe that's just my copy of The Troublemakers. Yeah, yeah. It is, it is a spicy book. Uh, <laughs> All right. Thanks for following along, everyone. Hit subscribe, like us, please uh, check it out. And uh, Living the Lime mailing list, I've just started sending out uh, stuff there. So um, you'll get these announcements before everybody else. Livingthelinebooks.com. You can take a look below for the link. All right. And the Living the Line Instagram will have all the latest updates as well. Yep. You got it. All right. Take care, everybody. What's the audience books? Smash that subscribe button and the like button and the bell and then you get them.